J.P. Morosi of the MLB Network. He's joining us right now. John Morosi, Kirk Morrison here filling in for Rich. How we doing, John? Kirk, I am outstanding, my friend. It has been too long since uh, <laughs> our days of talking on a weekly basis, my friend. I always love catching up with you on football, baseball, and all topics in between. Yeah, John will be part of MLB Network. 17 straight hours of live opening day coverage beginning tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Eastern. Visit MLBnetwork.com for your local channel listings. Okay, so what are you doing for 17 hours, John? Where will you be at? Are you in studio? Are you on site? Where will you be at? <laughs> Uh, I'll be in uh, the the local studio that I have here in Michigan. Uh, oh. I'm on MLB Central every day. You can almost set your watch by it every weekday around 10:30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we, so we've got a new uh, new show tomorrow launching. Robert Flores joins the team as a, a full time host of the show, so okay. uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I try to bring a little bit of news, a little bit of perspective uh, during that 10:30 uh, a.m. segment every weekday. So that'll be uh, on my docket from the uh, from the home town studio there tomorrow okay good good because now i, I need your, your insider information because uh you know i do a spring training tour every year i go down i bring the family we go down to i'm a cactus league guy i think i told you that not a grapefruit yeah, league so yeah. I'm a, yeah i'm an arizona guy so i catch as many games as possible and so i'm still trying to figure out the biggest storyline john going into this mlb season is well I'm glad you asked, because to me it's the Yankees. And you teased it before the break. Uh, we have not had a repeat champion in Major League Baseball since the Yankees uh, in 2000. They, of course, won three straight, 98, 99, 2000, back when Derek Jeter was a shortstop and not a team owner, which, of course, is the case now. <laughs> right. uh, but I, I think to me it's, it's this rebooted, reimagined Yankee team bringing in Stanton, uh, people around that team. I saw the recent comments from John Sterling, the radio broadcaster, that he is as, as excited about this team as he ever has been for a Yankee season, which I think says a lot about all the stars they've had in the past. But you really get the sense, Kirk, that here's a team that was the dominant force in the game for a period of time, and now they're back in a big way, not just getting to the ALCS as they were last year, but it's almost as though the Yankees are back on the map because anything short of a World Series championship for them is going to be a failure. And speaking of teams that are all in, I love this as well. On the <laughs> National League side, Kirk, right. a storyline that I'm going to watch a lot during the course of the year. Clayton Kershaw is in the final year before he can opt out of his contract with the Dodgers. Bryce Harper's in the last year mm. of his contract with the Nationals. There's no way that both of them will be happy when the season is over because right. one of them, at, at, at most, one of them can win the World Series, and that is where the bar is for both of them as well. So I love it. You've got the Yankees going all in, getting Stanton. You've got Kershaw and Harper desperate to win in their final years with their franchises potentially. You've got a lot of desperation from a lot of teams with a lot of talent, which I love. A lot of all-in teams right now in Major League Baseball. MLB Network analyst uh, John Morosi joined the Rich Eisen show. And John is are, I mean well are we going to give Clayton Kershaw and Bryce Harper the LeBron James treatment this year of basically knowing they have the opportunity to opt out and be free agents or be a free agent altogether how many times will they be asked the question hey what are you going to do about next year because they're going to hear it all if the Dodgers go on a losing streak or the Nationals aren't where they're supposed to be how many times will we hear these guys have to answer those questions? It's a great question, Kirk. And I think it, it speaks to maybe just a little bit of a different focus on the, on the big 162 of, of all the games and, and the way that maybe those questions seem to be handled nowadays in baseball relative to the NBA. I think in, in baseball, Harper came out at his very first press conference of the season in spring training and said, basically, if you ask me about 2018, the interview's over. That's how he handled it. So he did not want to talk about it at all. Uh, Kershaw has always been somewhat guarded in speaking about himself and his own plans. Um, and so I, I don't expect we're going to see a lot of revelations coming out from Clayton Kershaw during the, during the coming months. I think it's interesting that in, the, that in the NBA, and I love this, by the way, about the NBA, the players are, are outspoken yes. and, and <laughs> are very aware of their ability to basically control the chess pieces of the entire <laughs> landscape of the league. It's like, hey, if we all go to this team, 
we're going to be dominant, we're going to win. And I, I love the fact that it's very out there in the open and then people talk about it. In, in baseball, it's a little more uh, guarded, which I, I think both – we understand certainly who's going to be a free agent. It's not as though that by not talking about it from Harper's standpoint that we are going to talk about it any less because I think we're still going to talk about it as much as we all already would. It's just without his input. I, I love the way that LeBron and Chris Paul and Kevin Durant, the, the big stars of the NBA, have been very outspoken and maybe steering the conversation in that direction. And maybe we're going to see a time uh, – maybe – in the next couple of years where baseball gets to that point as well, but it does well seem to be that, that the players are being quite so candid uh, as maybe we see in basketball. So no Miguel Cabrera and Bryce Harper kind of power team at some point? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to see it. And actually, there were some comments earlier in the year, uh, I think Aaron Judge uh, in, in spring training talking about Manny Machado, where that was right. somewhat frowned upon. So I think it's just a different a different culture in terms of how much it's talked about. And uh, I think that's that's the unique part and great part about our country, that each sport has its own lexicon, own way of doing business. And for now, I think baseball is more focused on the, the, the long march ahead of the, the six-month regular season and, of course, the one month of playoffs. At John Morosi on Twitter, you can follow John. Morosi, MLB Network analyst uh, there on Twitter. Um, I was at spring training, I told you, a couple weeks ago, and I was trying to figure out where do you fall on this Shohei Otani right now? He's come over here, and the velocity is not what people thought it was going to be, John. He really only had maybe what one or two hits in all of spring training. Are the Angels having buyer's remorse, or what should we expect, or how are the Angels going to handle this Shohei Otani this season? First of all, Kirk, I would say the Angels are not having buyer's remorse in large part because the, the investment was not that big. It was, a, it was a relatively small signing bonus because of the way baseball's international rules work for amateurs, which Otani was until he signed this contract. So I think from a standpoint of the outlay, they've got to be comfortable with it. Um, they, they sat down. It was a really in-depth recruitment process. Um, and I think a lot of trust was developed between the front office of the Angels and his representation at CAA. So I, I think on that end of things, um, the Angels are going to be very reluctant to change and, and really disrupt the, the overall process that they had put in place for Otani a month ago just based on one month of underperformance. And candidly, it has been. As you point out, four hits, all singles. Uh, yes. Command has been spotty on the mound. Um, it was not the spring that they wanted to see out of him. No question about that. All that being said, he's going to start, uh, I believe it's the fourth game of the year, on Sunday against the A's. Uh, I think the Angels hope uh, somewhat of a lesser pressurized atmosphere. It's not going to be the season opener, not going to be the home opener. So just trying to let him settle in. Uh, but to your point, Kirk, the performance has not been there. Uh, the Angels, I'm sure, are still happy that he's on their team. Uh, but they may have to get very creative. I would say this on Otani. Watch very carefully about a month or six weeks in. If he's not hitting, mm. what do they do? Do they just say, you know what, we need you on the mound more? Because that's true. They need him more as a pitcher than a hitter. Do they scrap the hitting entirely and say, listen, we want you to focus on this one really hard thing, which is pitching in the big leagues, as opposed to trying to do two really hard things at the same time? Uh, it's, it's a great question, Kirk, and it's a great topic overall. But I, I think they're going to be guarded in their optimism, stay with the plan, but look for an audible potentially being called about six weeks into the season if things are not going the right way. A couple more for you here, John. Um... You know I'm a Bay Area guy, so I'm going to ask, yeah. ask you about, first of all, the San Francisco Giants. Obviously, um, Madison Bumgarner getting ready his last spring training start. He gets you know, hit on the throwing hand, going to be out the next two months. And you talked about teams going all in. We know the Giants, San Francisco Giants, they're going all in as well. What does this do for the early part of the season? Or does this, does this derail the San Francisco Giants at all, the injury to Madison Bumgarner? It's a fascinating subject, Kirk. And, of course, uh, in, in addition to the Samarja injury, as, as you point out, right. it's not just one pitcher, it's two. two right. uh, so starting, I love this, by the way, starting tomorrow, Dodgers-Giants. Marquee rivalry goes back to the early part, late part of the 1800s there in, in, in New York City. Uh, this ancient rivalry, the matchup is going to be not Kershaw and Bumgarner, Kershaw and lefty Ty Block. And you say <laughs> if you're a Dodger fan, well, we, we've got a good chance to win this game. Not necessarily. Ty Block in his career against the Dodgers, a 
two, three ERA. For some reason, they just do not see him very well. He's actually he's a quality pitcher that I think uh, people are overlooking here. So uh, I would say the Dodgers and their fans do not count on an easy win at opening day because <laughs> the Giants are throwing a guy in block who they've really struggled with um, uh, from, a, from a Dodgers offensive standpoint. But to your point, they, they really went all in trying to – Fortify this club after a disappointing finish last year. They were last place in the NL, really overall, last place in the whole league. Um, But they bring in McCutcheon, they bring in Longoria, and Kirk, I'm encouraged by this. They had the best team OPS of any team in the major leagues this spring training. Now you could say, well, what what do spring training numbers mean? (laughs) To me, it says this lineup was not as bad as it looked last year. I'm not saying they're the best team offensively, Mm -hmm. but they're certainly better than what we saw in 2017. So I'm optimistic they're going to have to find a way, though, to hit their way to some wins early on because they'll have some untested younger arms in rotation and Derek Holland coming in as a minor league free agent. He's going to be part of that opening day rotation there for the San Francisco Giants. Last question for you, John. Uh, A stinky situation here in Los Angeles last night. Uh, The sewage, uh, bad... I guess a pipe burst, something like that, with the Dodgers last night. Uh, the game was was uh, canceled in the fifth inning between the Dodgers and Angels. Uh, will that affect anything for opening day? Have you heard anything, or even a game ending the way that it did last night? Yeah, Kirk, I, I have not heard anything on that uh, regarding uh, changing of plans for opening day, but certainly an alarming circumstance. We've seen this happen before at the Coliseum. Yes. Uh, Dodger Stadium, people often forget, third oldest stadium in baseball. The only two that are older, Fenway and Wrigley. Uh, It it looks gorgeous, but there are some older bones there that maybe uh, we have to take a look at there uh, going forward. Hey, John, appreciate the time. Kirk, my pleasure, my friend. We'll have to catch up again real soon, okay? Yes, sound good. I'll pick your brain even more. (laughs) That was John Morosi, MLB Network Analyst. uh, He's on Twitter, at John Morosi. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern, on Audience.